Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for, for showing up for this wonderful presentation by Mark Lindquist titled Winter Amid War, Ukraine's Current Challenges. I'd like to thank Dennis um, and the NPAI for, for organizing and sponsoring this event along with the other sponsors. My name is Anastasia Andrianova and I'm an associate professor of English and also the faculty center president. Um, and I'm also Ukrainian American, so it, it, it is um, particularly meaningful to me to have Mark Linquist come and talk to us. I'd like to provide a very brief introduction. Mark J. Linquist, a Fargo-based Air Force Afghanistan war veteran, has been volunteering as a humanitarian aid worker in Ukraine mm -hmm. for the past six months. He and his team have delivered millions of dollars of medical supplies and humanitarian aid into the war zone and out to the front lines. During the forum, Linguist will share stories about the real life situation on the ground and offer a perspective from 10 miles away from the Russian army, as well as talking about the battlefield conditions and strategy we see playing out. The audience will gain insight about what the media doesn't show you, the incredible perseverance of the Ukrainian people and the simple ways Americans can help those fighting for their freedom in this winter. A Q&A will follow the program. Thank you. Mark. All right, my friends, thank you so much. Just want to say thanks to the uh, Northern Plains Ethics Institute, of course, uh, political science department here on campus, uh, uh, Dr. Jane Shu, Dr. Dennis Cooley, uh, North Dakota State University. And of course, thank you to the United States of America for allowing us to do something like this, right? So my name is Mark J. Lindquist, United States Air Force veteran, humanitarian volunteer, as was stated, been working over in Ukraine um, in the, the far reaches of the country for the past uh, eight months now. Uh, got over there in late March um, to move medical supplies, non-lethal humanitarian aid out to the front lines, to the refugees, to this displaced people, serving as many of the 15 million displaced folks and refugees as possible. Um, you know, we... We operate as close to as one kilometer away from the um, the Russian lines. The place where I headquarter and stay in Kharkiv, Ukraine, is ten miles away from uh, those lines. And um, you know, there's much work and 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 aid to be delivered there. What we do now is we collect five grand here at a local church or a community organization. Once we collect that, we get it over on planes on a pallet over to Warsaw. Our team gets it over across the border into Lviv, and we distribute it throughout the country. Uh, as fast as possible. So small aid packages uh, is what we've been delivering for the last nine months or so. So um, so first of all, I mean, it, it, it's an honor for me to, to be here at an Institute of Higher Learning and, and, and give any kind of talk. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a local kid from Ortonville, Minnesota, two hours south of here. I uh, had originally come up here for college 20 years ago. Uh, so to be here at NDSU, a place that I've known and, and respected for years is quite the honor. I don't necessarily bring to you any academic credentials uh, here today. Um, but what I do bring is maybe 15 years of a, some sort of, of uh, field research. You know, I've been traveling full time around the world for the past uh well, full-time for 10 years, and then, like I said, about 15 years of my adult life. Had the good fortune to travel to all 50 states at least three times, all 50 of them, many of them been to dozens of times as a traveler, been to 40-some countries on Earth, and had the good fortune to lead troops uh, in, in war zones, uh, been to a few of them over the years, uh, got out of the military 10 years ago, and been, been an entertainer and performer. And that allows me some unique opportunities um, you know, in 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 the uh, in the world, to be in some rooms that uh, let's see if we can get this going. There, here we go. To be in some rooms that are really unique. You know, to 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 have some conversations with folks that not everybody gets a chance to uh, to be involved in. And so, every once in a while, I'll find myself talking to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I'll find myself talking to to uh, you know former secretaries of defense or or CIA directors. Uh, uh, people of, of, of the caliber of a White House chief of staff or a former secretary of defense or a former CIA director, you know, you, you, you try to do some preparation. You try to, to come up with, if you're going to be in a room with that person, you know, don't ask a dumb question, you know, make sure that you're prepared because what I want to know in life is, is, is I want to know about, about 
you know, how the world works when you get in front of folks that are at these games, like the, the, the you know, we get a chance to have a conversation with the former president of the United States. And of course, the most important part, part about this photo is not me and the president. It's the Secret Service photo bomb right there. Right. You know, and this guy in the middle right here, you know, check him out. He went home and said, I got a picture with the president, you know get to talk to Leon Panetta, that guy. Did you know this guy's resume? Yeah, he was the CIA director, former chief of staff of the White House and secretary of defense. You think I asked that guy some interesting questions and want to know about how the world works? You know, that's Secretary Mark Esper, former secretary of defense, right after he left the Pentagon a while ago. Get to, you know, have a conversation with Carl Rove, you know, chief of staff, you know, probably the, the, the man who, who ran things around there in Washington for a few years. And when you get a chance to talk to a leader of the free world, right? You get some insight into how this whole thing works. You get an insight to how, 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 how the most powerful people on the planet act and maybe uh, what they're thinking. And you try to get some insight on that. And so when I think about those moments, I think, my goodness, what, what an honor to speak to somebody who be, could be considered a leader of the free world. Well, with this Ukraine issue in mind, then I ask myself, well, then obviously the issue of Ukraine has brought up the topic of freedom, right? And, and, and who gets to enjoy freedom? I would ask then what, what does the free world, what is it made up of? The ticker, the, the population counter on planet Earth just recently went over what? Eight billion people, right? So now there are 8 billion human beings alive on planet Earth. What percentage of those individuals live in what we call the free world? Does anybody know? How many billion people on planet Earth? Here, we'll, we'll do this here. For, uh, for, let's see, I've got some Ukrainian harivni here. Trivia question for two harivni. Anybody know how many billion of the 8 billion are free? Give a guess. Two. It's a pretty good guess. Here, you'll get it, sir. Ready? Ready? Here we go. Here we go. Good catch there, brother. <laughs> so 2.6 billion people, or roughly 28% of Earth's population, lives in what we would consider a free country or have freedom available. Now, of course, there's different freedom indexes. Some of the, the, the statistics say that it's 1.6 billion people, but somewhere around 2.3 or 2.6 billion people of the 8 billion people on planet Earth live in a free country or live in a free world, right? So think about that. 72% of the world doesn't have the freedoms that you and I may even take for granted, right? And so when I think about what this issue, Ukraine, and should we care about the people of Ukraine? Should people in America be concerned about this issue? Should we give our time, our energy, our effort, our attention? Should our country be prioritizing this as a matter of, of, of international affairs? And so I, I say to, to, to this audience, as we consider things like ethics and world politics and how we get along as societies on planet Earth, I would ask ourselves maybe that ethical question. So if there are 8 billion people on Earth, uh, planet Earth and 2.6 billion of us live a free life, then You've heard this phrase before. Certainly, we would maybe consider America to be one of the leaders of the free world, right? So of the 2.6 billion free citizens, certainly America would be want to be considered a leader of the free world. If you were going to get 100 people in a room together of those 2.6 billion, and we were going to discuss the topic of freedom, certainly Americans would feel as though, well, obviously, we would want to contribute to that discussion of freedom on planet Earth. You, you think of the things that we get to consider here in America, you know, the, the, the founding documents, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the concepts like inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. You go back to where did we get our Bill of Rights from the, the, the Bill of Rights that was written in England in the 1600s. Then you trace that back to the Magna Carta and all these issues that have given citizens on planet Earth and what is mostly the Western world what do we get to enjoy because we're part of that club of free citizens? The moral or ethical question being, if we are a leader of that free world, then do we have a responsibility to act 
to support, to defend, to protect others who want to live the same life that we do, a Western life, right? If you are going to take a look back at the last few centuries of our history, maybe this is a lens that I could uh, present to you as this is how I see what has happened when it comes to the issue of freedom on earth for the past few hundred years. In the 1700s, the United States of America, bold and brave as we were, decided, you know what, maybe it would be possible on planet Earth to rid ourselves of the, uh, the leadership that we currently had, which was by a king, right? And we proved that you could do such a thing in the 1700s, is, is throw off that tyrannical government and, and form a new nation based on the principles that we hold dear today. In the 1800s, we proved that if that king came back and tried to do it again, that we could repel him. We also proved on planet Earth that even amidst an internal skirmish that could fracture the country, the Civil War, that we could survive that. The 1900s proved that if dictatorship and autocracy and tyranny rears its ugly head on the European continent, then the opposing force was able to beat back Hitler and the Nazis of the 1940s on Europe's continent. So when you think about when that happens on planet Earth and, and an out of control dictator starts to run amok, who, who would be there on planet Earth to stop that if not for the people that believed in freedom? Of course it's us. Of course it's the, the only opposing force that could have stopped what was happening on the European continent 80 years ago in World War II was the people who believe in freedom and democracy. And I think that now the question that's being asked of us in the 21st century is, can freedom prevail yet again with changing circumstances, right? With now the nuclear threat, with now Russia versus Ukraine in the current military situation, with now NATO and the UN and the agreements that are in place and application to the European Union and all these different variables. The big question for society is in this century, are we going to win like we did last century? Or what's going to happen? I think the question is, is the idea that America is filled with Americans who are great, you know, the greatest generation, that's what we call that group of people who endured through the Great Depression and then and persevered through, through the war effort and all that it entailed. The question being, are the days of great Americans a thing of the past? Or do the Americans that are alive today witnessing what's happening on planet Earth, do we have a role to play? Do we have a responsibility even? Um, what I'd like to do here is, is uh, because I think we have a unique opportunity. One of the things that I had envisioned when going over there as just a regular citizen to volunteer, do some humanitarian work, is that maybe I could come back and tell the story. Because inevitably, in these situations, as we were talking about earlier with the media, you never really know. You never really know if they're getting it right. And so since I've been boots on the ground, I wanted to give you just a little uh, uh, kind of um, from the horse's mouth perspective on Ukraine. Uh, and as we talk about some of these points, we're going to be getting through uh, certainly some some ethical questions as well. Um, so it, it's uh, just kind of a, a, a top 10 list that I think the average American may not know about what's going on over there. We'll share some statistics, some, some perspectives on, on what is going on and why it may lead us to want to to help and be compelled to action. You know, one of the things, and you can tell me by head nods or verbally here in the small audience, just do, do you think that the media has done a very good job telling people about life, about what life is like in Ukraine, like the everyday life? Have you heard any of those stories? What it's like for citizens going to work, trying to survive in society, or do you only get the news broadcast from in front of the bombed out building? Is that what it is really kind of, is that the sensational thing, sir? Well, one of the things that I want to bring is, is this perspective that it actually, I had never been to Ukraine. I would never traveled there before. Um, I just knew that this was a, a cause and, and that, that seemed very closely tied to the reasons why I signed up for the U.S. military. 
right? I mean, they're, they're very clo uh, closely related themes for freedom and independence and, 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 and all that. And so when I got over there, I had to learn a lot about this society and culture. And one thing I have to report is I wish that the news would concentrate on uh, what I believe are the, the similarities that we have with Ukrainian society and culture. I want to tell you, they have more iPhone 14s over there than we have. They use Wi-Fi. I, I have hundreds of Uber rides that I've taken all throughout Ukraine. We order food delivery. There's five-star resorts and restaurants. The cities in Ukraine, Kiev, Dnipro, Lviv, Zaporizhia, Odessa, Kherson, all of these, these places that you hear about on the news, they are as modern as downtown Minneapolis, right? You operate over in, it's a Western country. After 1991, there was some former Soviet Socialist Republics that went, you know, the auto autocracy kind of dictatorship route. And some countries went toward the Western way of life. And the way that Ukraine has decided to move post-Soviet Union has been directly a beeline, not a beeline, but certainly today represents a Western world where if, if you and I, if everybody went out, got on a plane today and went to Warsaw, we got over the border the next day. I brought you to Lviv and I said, let's go get a, a coffee. Let's go to a restaurant. Let's book a hotel. Everything you would do to live life like you were on vacation, it's the same. Every city in, U in Ukraine feels like every other of the 50 European cities that I've traveled to, right? The villages in the rural areas are poor. And they are not as well developed as, as the cities, maybe. But certainly, Ukraine is as similar to America and our Western way of life as you could possibly get. The only thing that's different is that I speak a different language over there or have to work through a translator, right? I don't know if people in America have been told they drive Teslas in Ukraine, Fords and Chevys, Audis and Volkswagens, right? Use 5G. They're on Facebook and Instagram, right? These folks, it's so similar. The climate is also similar. I don't know if they've reported those kinds of things. The Dunbos is the same latitude as International Falls, Minnesota. You didn't know that, right? North of Kiev, you know, European Bucha during the siege of Kiev in March, north of Kiev is equal to two hours north of Winnipeg. The Black Sea down here, San uh, uh, Zaporizhia area, Mari uh, uh, Mariupol, Odessa, that's like Minneapolis-St. Paul latitude. Now, the European continent, of course, is, is a little bit warmer than ours. But, I mean, we're talking, this is the same part of the world where you read about it in World War II and the death marches from camp to camp and people would freeze to death walking from Dachau to, to Auschwitz. This is the same part of the world, right? And, and then my, I guess the ethical question being is, is once you realize that these people are, are, could easily be your best friend, could easily be someone that your family marries into, could easily be somebody that you would know for your entire life because they're just, they live a Western life. If, if that's the case, and we know that, do we not have some sort of moral or ethical responsibility to say, well, if you've achieved a Western life full of just about as many freedoms as we do in America, and if we were the original, maybe you're the remix, if you want to look at it like that, right? Certainly, the reason why you enjoy freedom today is because America kept the light burning through the 1800s. Did we know that in the 1800s, back when, you know, I don't know what people think or know about how this freedom thing has worked out throughout history. But in the 1800s, 2% of the world's population lived in a free country. We were the only ones keeping that torch lit, right? And so now all of the, the outgrowth of now about half of the world's countries enjoy some sort of form of democracy or freedom. Well, who's, who's, to whose credit is that? The, the rest of the world can enjoy these things. Well, likely, I would point to the United States of America as getting credit for some of that, for keeping that going through the 1800s. And now, now, when an autocracy falls or crumbles in the 1900s, then Ukraine can choose a freedom, a, a path full of freedom, right? And so what responsibility do we as a nation or as citizens in a society have to those people? And I would say that we bear a great responsibility for those citizens of freedom, even though they're not on our continent, they certainly, no human being deserves to be struck by a missile when they're just trying to go to work, right? 
some quick statistics here will just give you a, a, a perspective of the scope and size and scale of this whole thing. I don't know if, if, if it has been communicated through the news just how big this refugee crisis is. It's the second largest refugee crisis since World War II. Over 15 million people are not living at home. Now it's almost 16 million people. So that first uh, uh, note up there, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota. To get an idea of how many people have moved out of Ukraine and into Europe, and then they're now refugees, not, li not living at home. To give you an idea, that would be as if everybody from the states of Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, all the human beings in all three of these states, if all of us just pointed the car west and drove to Montana and had to live there for the next six months, if everybody from these three states ended up in, in eastern Montana, that would be the scope and the scale and the size of the humanitarian crisis that's going on over there. If that happened, if we all moved to Montana, how much help would be needed in Montana, right? And, and the same number of people are now not living at home. Think if everybody from Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, all 8 million of us or so, 7 million, if we all just had to live somewhere else for the next six months inside this territory, that's, that's how many people are being moved around and now are in need. And also, once they move to that place, if you're still in Ukraine, the 8 million of the displaced people, you only got power. 30% of the time in that country right now, right? The front lines are the distance between New York to Dallas. That would also be from Fargo to Atlanta. The front lines in this battle are huge. So it's wonderful that we can hear the reports of the front line successes where we're pushing some of the Russian troops back. But remember, on a, on a, on a line from Fargo to Atlanta, there's a lot of battlefields out there that you don't hear about where maybe we're not doing so well because of the size of this largest ground war since World War II on Europe's continent. A third of the country is not living at home. You know, think about that. If, if that were us, that'd, that'd be 110 million people not living at home. And so the, the need is certainly great. I would say that there's another question that I look out at, at the world. I come back to America and we're largely operating as, as normal, right? You, you go to the shopping mall, you go to the football game and things are as normal. Folks, the second largest refugee crisis on planet Earth ever is going on. Second only to World War II. And it just seems to me that an all hands on deck effort must be mounted in order to match the level of the need that may not be fully comprehended right now. Cost of World War II, two. you know, of course, we talk a lot about the money that's being spent on, on this conflict and the United States being a leader in that, in that foreign aid. I was doing some research and I came upon this statistic. I didn't know it before. So when it came to all of the bombs and the, the bullets and the planes and the tanks that we needed to build during World War II, when it came to the bill that came due to send all of our boys over the ocean to war, when it came to how much money it cost, it was $341 billion back in the 1940s, right? That would be the equivalent of $5.6 trillion today. The bill was $341 billion for that whole thing. Did you know that only less than half of that $341 billion was collected via tax revenue? The other 52% or $180 billion was collected via war bonds, right? Remember the war bonds? I wasn't, I'm not old enough to remember those, but certainly grandma and grandpa would talk to me about war bonds and rationing and price controls and, and doing whatever we can to, to, to support the war effort. So think about the significance of that. That means that the American people thought that the cause of freedom on Europe, Europe's continent was so important that they put their savings in a government vehicle with the rate of return and gave the, the government enough money to support and operate for the war. Canada, for this conflict since Ukraine's war started in February 24th, Canada has opened up war bonds. And it's, I think it's a five-year bond. Uh, to raise money to allow their citizens to be able to contribute to the war, and they're offering a rate of return. Ukraine opened up war bonds for their citizens, and 70,000 of their people gave, I think, $3.1 billion to pay their, their soldiers. And they're giving a, I think they're giving like an 11% rate of return for an annual uh, one-year war bond in Ukraine. 
And so there, 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 there might not be an awareness that, that what we think about with World War II and the greatest generation and how we made through it and how we persevered, that there was a massive effort on the part of the citizens to, to do what they didn't need to do but they did it because they knew it was the right thing to do, which was go all in and contribute to this cause of freedom on earth that we see playing out then back in the black and white movie theaters of the day in the reports from the fireside chats, that they hear about that. And don't you see with this Ukraine thing, doesn't it kind of feel like we've seen this movie before? Doesn't it seem like some of the atrocities that we read about in our history books from 80 years ago, that a lot of those things are, are, are being repeated, then, then I would just like to inform the people that there was a role for the citizens to play, separate from governments and armies. The average individual, what control do you have over that anyway? Or, or agency to, to, to move the levers of governments and armies. Certainly there is an individual responsibility for us to to support these causes in these Ukrainians in a time uh, uh, that that is um, or could be considered uh, just as worthy a cause as to support those from 80 years ago on that same continent. That's going to get deep into numbers. We're just going to go real quick. A lot of people will talk about this issue of Ukraine, the $91 billion that if this latest appropriation or package gets approved, that our total bill that America would have spent uh, on the war in Ukraine is $91 billion. I just like to inform people because many times, I mean, that seems like a lot of, a lot of money. $91 billion is a lot of money, right? Of course it is. But just to put it into some context, when, 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 when you start talking about billions of dollars, a lot of times like you can't get your mind around it until you give it some context or meaning, right? And I'll attempt to do that here. That, that of that 91 billion, just understand from my perspective, only 20 billion or roughly there's, thereabouts has been given to security assistance or military aid, right? So $20 billion in military aid of that total package, the rest was humanitarian aid or financial assistance to prop up economies and governments and European countries that, that need financial assistance during this time. So $20 billion is, is a small sum when it comes to defense spending, right? That next set of numbers there, 173 billion is what the United States military pays for its personnel, its people, right? That's $173 billion a year. So Ukraine's army is roughly half of our size. So I put this number here. So that, that to, to outfit an army Ukraine size, outfitting soldiers as we do, it would cost $86.5 billion just to pay a million soldiers the right way and outfit them, right? And we've given $20 billion to their effort, right? An average, or no, this, this fiscal year, the United States of America is spending $245 billion on new weapon systems this year, right? My assertion or opinion is if, I mean, may, maybe we don't need $245 billion in new weapon systems anymore, right? Maybe we've, we've, we've been spending a trillion dollars a year for the last 20 years on, on, on military armament. And you're talking to a veteran that's saying this, maybe we don't need that. Maybe we could give a portion of that to Ukraine to defend freedom on earth right now. And, and they will, and they'll hold the front lines back with that money. Give them the money we were going to spend on our next weapon system with Lockheed Martin. What are the weapons for anyway? To protect and, and support freedom. So when you hear these numbers and you hear your, your friends and your neighbors and the people at the coffee shop spout off about some of these numbers, I just wonder if, if they know what they're talking about, right? Do they know that of that 91 billion proposed, the 10 billion of it won't be spent until 2026 anyway? You know, some of these agreements and deals last, last the better part of a decade before they're fully appropriated, right? And so you can throw these numbers out to make a point, but if you really get down to the granular detail, from my perspective, if we're going to be a nation that spends $1.6 trillion on defense, $1.6 trillion this year at the Pentagon, then if Ukraine is going to fight the second largest army on planet Earth for us and be the front lines of freedom, I would advocate that uh, maybe more uh, be, be, be given uh, on the military side of things. I don't know if you knew that there were thousands of Westerners and volunteers, as I mentioned earlier, 
in Poland and Ukraine roaming around trying to help people. There still remains hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that I know of. And there's certainly hundreds and thousands of people that I don't know of that are still operating out there, still delivering winter supplies. We just collected some over here. Dr. Cooley was nice enough to, to, to donate those things. And we're collecting these little aid packages, $5,000 at a time, because the way to do it most efficiently and effectively is to get the number of a local Ukrainian who gave you the list of items that they needed today. You get a drop point in a place in coordinates where you're going to meet that individual. You take a picture of the aid delivered to them, and then you follow up with them, right? Because there is a little bit of corruption out there and people, things do get lost. And so what you want to do is you want to find local Ukrainians that are coordinating with Westerners who can get out of the country and move these things in. And we have a team of hundreds of folks that can do this work. And I just don't know if that was publicized because I think one of the things many Americans have asked themselves this last year is, I want to help Ukrainians, but I don't know how. How do I help? How do I make sure that I donate to something where, you know, I know it's going to get there or that it's not going to end up in the hands of a Russian oligarch, right? And so we're trying to provide that opportunity. I didn't know that if you knew this, that even with all this talk about billions and, and money that we're spending, it, it, it puts it into perspective when you realize that America was, will spend $800 billion on Christmas this year. You want to complain about inflation and, and prices being too high and woe is me and all this stuff. Re, what, look at the stats in January. I guarantee it. It's going to be 800 billion. Again, some consumer forecasts say it's going to be a trillion dollars, right? So if you're going to spend almost a trillion dollars on Christmas this year, buying gifts for mom and dad that don't need anything, then don't complain to me about what we're doing, supporting people who are fighting for freedom on Europe's continent. Just my perspective. Red Cross, UNICEF, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UN OCHA, that's the uh, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, of course, I've supported these organizations in the past. One thing that is sad to report is that although I'm not certainly trying to badmouth them or poo-poo them in their work they do, but in this situation, it's just a little different because you're dealing with a war zone and not a, not a hurricane because you're dealing with, with active threat and insurance policies for these big NGOs the further we got out to the Dunbus, you didn't see a lot of these folks out there. Not because they don't want to help necessarily, but maybe, maybe their charter or their insurance policy won't allow them to be roaming on the Dunbus where their volunteers could get hit by a missile. And so largely, we have seen, my report being to you, is if you want to help, you have to deliver it to the small operator that isn't bound by all this bureaucracy of the big NGOs. Unfortunately, much of the money ends up in the, in the big people's hands. And in this conflict specifically, they're not able to properly spend the resources because they don't get out far enough into the war zone to know where, what is really needed, right? And so it's, it's been a, a fascinating um, learning curve about who is effective in conflicts like this at delivering aid and fast. I don't know if you know, we stood up a million man army on private donations. The Ukrainian military was 200,000 strong of army regulars when February kicked off. And now we've tried to build it to a million. And they're just, I don't care, I don't care how powerful your government is. S standing up a million man army in the course of a year, like the US government would have a hard time doing that. The most powerful military on earth, the most, most well oiled you know, defense apparatus on the planet. If you opened up 800,000 slots for recruitment for the US Army, Marines, Air Force, and Navy today, I mean, it would, it would take forever to stand up that kind of, 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 of force. And so what we've ended up having to do is Western volunteers and uh, private individuals and donors have had to do everything from body armor ballistic helmets, like we were talking earlier, uniform items, all these things, um, just to get these people ready to stand on a line and hold the line for the winter. One of the things I don't th think people maybe understand or know, uh, over there, this is a different war. This is, a, this is a war that's being fought like a World War II conflict. It's an artillery war, you know? I've had friends that are snipers that have been out uh, on the front lines and they never fired a shot. Never saw a Russian because they don't get out of their armored personnel carriers or their tanks. They're poorly trained and usually tank columns come accompanied by infantry. But in this situation, they just stay inside where it's safe. 
and you don't get to fire around. There's not a lot of small arms fire over there in this war. Meaning, and the reason why I share this is, is because then that changes the nature of the injuries that you're trying to treat as combat medics and frontline medical hospitals, right? Is that now, instead of small arms fire that might be withstood by ballistic uh, helmets and, 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 and body armor or flak vests, now it's shrapnel. Right, it's artillery shells, missiles, and rockets landing in close proximity to a, a troop position. And so, what we see over there is heavily leaning toward uh, shrapnel wounds that took off limbs, and in some cases, if close enough, um, you know, like th there's nothing left of the body. Right. The point being, over there, tourniquets are very important because if you lose a limb, you got two minutes before you bleed out. Right. And so the situation has been so dire because there's so many troops getting stood up so fast. I mean, we had to make tourniquets out of ratchet straps, right? To be able to put enough pressure on the wound because you just, Europe was sold out of these things, right? And so um, there's, it's, a, it's a very unique to an American military member who only sees injuries from guys that were sitting in up armored Humvees and MRAPs. Now, you know, from roadside bombs, now we're seeing the weapons of World War II visited on, on people that don't have proper armor and, and maybe it wouldn't do anything in the first place, right? And so now we in the American military assume that once we get blown up in Iraq and Afghanistan within 12, maybe 16 hours, we're at Landstuhl at the military hospital in Germany. Here, there's not a lot of medevacs, right? You have to drive in an ambulance from the front line ride three hours to the local hospital on roads that are full of potholes and muddy. And, and a lot of the guys don't make it because three hours is just too long. You should have a field hospital 15 minutes away. Right. And so it's a very unique situation over there on the, on the, on the battlefield. And the final thing I'll, I'll say real quick here is I, I don't know. I don't know how much people have realized that you, you could go over to Ukraine and you could operate and you could meet people and you could network and you could work together. And, and it is, it is just as likely that you would meet somebody in Ukraine, a local Ukrainian who ends up being your best friend as you meeting somebody at the bison game this weekend, right? You travel around the country and you go from Lviv over on the left side of your map. You go and you get in, in into the country and you learn the, the lay of the land. You get up to Kiev, the nation's capital, sixth largest city in Europe. You move over to Dnipro, which is three hours away from the Donbass, and you start networking with these folks. And, and you meet these wonderful people that are just trying to live their life. There's an 80-year-old woman named Tatiana in Kharkiv who, who lives alone. She's retired. She was a teacher. I, get, I met her on the street and, and her house didn't get hit by a missile on the day that there were 600 rocket attacks in the city of Kharkiv with 600 residential buildings being hit back in March in one day. Her home didn't get hit, but the home across the street did. And so from the concussion, she's got shrapnel holes in her roof. You can stand in her living room and look out through the sky. The foundation of her brick home is cracked and the windows are blown out. and it's International Falls, Minnesota weather in that neighborhood right now, right? They may have electric at certain times, but Kharkiv, a lot of my friends are burning wood to stay warm. In modern Europe, in 2022, these people, this is Vlad, that, that, that's Kostya, this is, this is um, Oleg, these folks, that are just, this guy is a photographer and a videographer, right? He works a virtual job. This is Katya. She invited me to her wedding because in the midst of a war, she said, you know what? We have to find something to, to, to be joyful about. While we do have our freedom show, she invited me to her wedding. These people, this is Vera in Dnipro. She works 20 hours a day to help her fellow soldiers, people that she doesn't know, but that are fighting for her country. These could be people that would be your best friends. When I walk in the room, they drop everything, they scream and they come over and we hug. Can these people be all that different from us? If a guy can walk over into a war zone in a foreign country where I've never been before, I don't speak the language, 
And within the course of six months, you can form relationships to the point where they give you a long embrace before you leave. Or when you walk in the door, they're so happy to see you. Then my point is that if you want to view this conflict through an ethical lens, through, through a, 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 a question of, of what, what must we do at this point in time, knowing what's going on with a woman who is just trying to live in the house behind her, but you see the shrapnel holes on her fence. If we don't give these people our best effort, what, what kind of person am I if I look myself in the mirror and say, I could go and help, but I didn't, right? I didn't have to go over there and do all this, this work, but, but sometimes there's something that happens in, in life and on planet Earth that compels you to act and say, you know what, if anything on Earth right now deserves my best effort, this is it. And so I'm putting teams together, keeping teams together of volunteers to help these people just to deliver some, some, some gear to keep them warm this winter. I mean, how humane is that? To deliver something warm so that when you're sitting out in a trench in the Dunbas and it's 15 degrees out and you're cold and wet for the next six months and you can't get warm for the next six months, how humane is that to deliver somebody a, a, a hoodie? And so me and my fellow volunteers, I just delivered a $7,500 uh, uh, package of aid down to Minneapolis. I was in Chicago yesterday at, at, at 9 a.m. And we're moving these things all over the country. We're getting them over on planes. We collect five grand from your local church and your charity group and your local group of neighbors or your Kiwanis or your Lions or Rotary Club. And all I'm doing here in America is just activating little pockets of volunteers. It doesn't take more than six people. My college friend, Kristen, got a hold of me. Hadn't heard from her for 20 years. Says, me and six friends want to help. They did a couple fundraisers. They sent me two grand. You know, that's 200 tourniquets. So that's what we're doing is we're just trying to spread the word about ways that we can help these people. There are ways to help. I think a lot of people do want to help. Maybe they don't know how. I'm a local guy, local veteran. I don't get paid for this. I'm covering all my own expenses. Every volunteer that has gone over there spent a bunch of their own money just trying to do the right thing. We're not in it for the money. We're in it to save lives in a place that desperately needs America's help. Why did I come back to America to make this appeal? Because it's here in America where people can help. The people in Ukraine can't do it anymore. They've spent all of their savings. Their businesses are shuttered. The, the, the economy in Ukraine is twice as bad as our Great Depression. Unemployment in Ukraine is twice as bad as our Great Depression. During our Revolutionary War, there was a general named Marquis de Lafayette. He was a French aristocrat. And in 1777, he came over and pledged allegiance to the United States of America. Because France, you know, we were just an upstart idea. France had been going on for 800 years. They had a military. They knew what they were doing. And so Mar Marquis de Lafayette, a major general who didn't need to, came over to America and fought for us for four years. During that time, he went back to France and appealed to the French government and the people to send more aid to America. And then he came back and helped us win the Battle of Yorktown. That was a French general who volunteered for a foreign army. And he helped us. And we're here today maybe because of it. Right? I think that in this case, we, the Western volunteers, are following the footsteps of Marquis de Lafayette. Because right now we're back in America making an appeal for a foreign land who deserves freedom just as much as we did 246 years ago. So that's my appeal. That's my case. And that's why I'm here to partner with local people just to get this stuff over there one bag at a time. I know how to get it over there. We've been running logistics like this for nine months. If you trust us with that, that bag, you'll see a photo of that standing next to Ukrainian in the next 10 days right? It's the best way I know how to help these people. I can't help all 15 million, but I can help the folks that I know and that I have contacts with. So right now, we probably have, uh, what, what kind of time here? Do we have 10 minutes for Q&A here? Oh, 
Oh, we got time. Let's do a little Q&A and then I'm just going to wrap it up with a little five minute story at the end. But um, obviously you've been watching this go on for nine months. You wouldn't be here unless it was something that was important to you. What are the questions that you have or have had as you've seen this thing unfold? What are the things you've been frustrated about? What are the things that you think might be, uh, you know, some misinformation you want some clarification on? Who's got maybe the first question to start us off? Go ahead. This is maybe that to the question, but what really um, makes me wonder is doesn't Putler and the Russians, don't they think that someday they might want to join the community of nations again? Mm -hmm. I, I just don't understand the lack of forward thinking. Yeah. Um, it's, it's infuriating. I think it's, it's, a long, it's a long and difficult process to try to put yourself into the shoes of the Soviet mindset, you know, um, love and resentment. Yeah, and, and I mean, I just, I, I, I wouldn't probably. Maybe local Ukrainians would be way better at answering the question about what's in the mind of, of Russians and why do they think the way they do. Uh, I do know one thing: it's very dangerous. The things that you can do and accomplish when you brainwash 144 million people in your whole society, like you can get them to do some crazy stuff, you know. Uh, and I see those tactics being used. On, on on many societies now because of the use of the internet. You know, these folks are smart. These folks in St. Petersburg and the folks in, you know, these, ha you know, hacking camps in China, like it's it's serious. Um, the way that you can control the minds and the thoughts of, of an entire population uh, to believe that Ukraine is full of Nazis. That's insane and stupid. And anybody that says that, you come talk to me right away. Like there's, there's, there's more Nazis in my pocket than there are in the Ukraine, right? It's, it's it's just a narrative that has been um, formed um, that, that that's foolish, but they're 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 certain of it. You know, there's they're as certain of that truth as you are of yours. Um, do so. Do I believe that they will all of a sudden have an epiphany? No, I don't. Um, week before last, Boris Johnson was interviewed by I don't remember who it was, and he had a great idea. He said, you know, Putin can just. Not like the second week in September when it showed, when we were obvious, it was obvious that everything was changing and they weren't good. They were a disaster um, with their ramshackle army that Putin should have said, you know, we checked it out and there aren't any Nazis there. We did, we did our, um, we did our special military operation and we discovered that we were wrong. So, and didn't leave, you know, he could have saved face that way. Yeah. But he doesn't have those kind of. Where's stuff. Hans Blix when you need him, right? Let's send that guy over. And there's got to be a way to 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 do it peacefully. And and but I just I mean, those things are above my pay grade. You know, I, obviously, I'm not in those rooms. I hope that there's some sort of, you know, ceasefire or whatever. But then that means you're giving up Ukrainian land. I mean, it's, it's just it's, it's just like there aren't a lot of great solutions. A lot of people will ask me questions about, like, how does it end? I don't know. I. In the intelligence realm, we think about. Uh, you know, operations in terms of probabilities of success and certainty, you know, high certainty, medium certainty, you know, uncertain. Um, when you got Vladimir Putin as a variable, like you, you just can't get that probability up of certainty very high because nobody knows what the guy is thinking. Uh, in Ben Hodges and um, uh, other, others and the Ukrainians say that they are going to push the Russians completely out of their country by next summer. Yeah, and you know, and, and if you listen to um, our chairman and joint chiefs of staff, you know, he says, "Yeah, that's great, but yeah. that's a heavy lift." You know, um, the, the 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 size and and the the amount of area that we're talking about. I mean, it's 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 not. I mean. It's the size of Texas. It takes you 20 hours to get across the country. Like I said, this is this is from Fargo to Atlanta. You know, that's a, that's a long distance. A lot of this is heavily entrenched, been in there for years and years. You don't know where the Mayans are in this territory, right? And so I think it's interesting for the United States of America and and and, and just the world to be observing a frontline war. America and Americans were conditioned by 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. We got a whole army out there right now active duty that doesn't know how to fight a frontline war. You ever think about that? We don't know how to do that. We, we outfitted our whole military for insurgents, 
terrorist cells and IEDs, right? And now the Ukrainians are teaching us how to hold the line. It's a whole different set of tactics. And now with this war, you got to remember what it was like for the CNN embedded reporters rolling into Baghdad. Was that 2003? I think, you know, it was just fascinating for us to have that level of access of an embedded reporter on, on the war front. Well, now, you know, these guys are out there with their Instagram lives, right? They're out there broadcasting from the front line real time. It's insane. The, the speed and the pace of warfare is, is, is moving so quickly. You know, the reason why I, I, I did bring some of these photos with is because the reason why I wear this uniform here to show, to show, you know, the world, this is what a soldier looks like today, right? This is, this guy's wearing four different kinds of camouflage. Today, there isn't a, a, a supply depot the size of the Pentagon for, for people who want to support this military to go to and go check out a uniform or a, a nice set of gear. I bought this on Amazon because I could. This guy bought this at the local bazaar and wherever he could cobble this together, right? The, the people supporting the military over there look exactly like me. They get a, a patch from the local, you know, bazaar. They, they get an American flag. And now, now you have declared your loyalty. There's no rule book. There's no regulation. Talk about, you know, the, the, the Institute for Ethics. I don't know if it was ethical for me to sign a contract to join a foreign legion. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that as a veteran of the United States. Like, when was the last time you were posed with that question? I don't know. I know my State Department in the White House doesn't want me operating in that country. They tell me to get out of the country. Is that ethical for me to be there? You know, some people have thanked me or congratulated me for, the, for my work, but I'm disobeying the offers of the office, orders of the office of the President of the United States. They said, get the heck out of that country way back in March. I've been roaming around doing whatever I want, right? Think about that. When it came to the decision for foreign veterans to sign a piece of paper with the Ukrainian consulate in Chicago for enlistment in the foreign legion, that doesn't happen very often. If you know your history about foreign legions, we haven't seen a... a, a Sovereign government call for foreign soldiers to fight on their behalf, really to any degree, since the Spanish Civil War and the, the international brigades of the 1930s. Previous to that, it was the French Foreign Legion in the 1830s. And so the call came out the, the Saturday after February 24th. Zelensky called for a foreign legion, and I called my military buddies, and I said, hey, that call was for us, for the 60 million roughly veterans that are alive on planet Earth today, if ever there was somebody who was supposed to be listening to that call, it's guys like us, gals like us, right? And so I asked my friends, you know, if this is something we should do. And I en ended up being one of the guys to go. I don't know if that was legal, if I can do that. But I just felt like the call and, and, and the, 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 the compelling reason to go was, was more important than any um, regulation or legality. Um, you, you sort of set up this um, an understanding that I kind of met, like already came in with, that Ukraine is essentially a Western country. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, 90 billion in the face of, of a war on this scale and just comparing that to the United States, like entire military budget, I'm wondering what the political hangup is that we haven't invested, you know, more. It seems like this is kind of the whole point of having such a massive standing army. We don't have right. that much to defend on our own soil. Right. I mean, I'm, a, I'm of your opinion. I'm, I'm of the opinion, boy, it, it doesn't seem like we're really putting our foot on the gas. Yeah, what are, do you know what the political hangups are? Um, I, th I think and maybe others in the room could, could give a better perspective. Mine is this. I think that there has been a lack of understanding about what foreign aid really is and what it does, right? I think it comes from, you know, maybe a bigger question or problem in our society is that not enough people travel to places that would receive foreign aid to know what your return on investment is, you know? People, these two oceans isolate a lot of us, and we never get out to the places that do need foreign aid and, and realize how far a billion dollars goes in some countries on Earth, 
You know, take, for example, the U.S. dollar. I can usually get about three to four times the amount of, of goods in Ukraine using the U.S. dollar than I can back here. Meaning my dollar or that billion do dollars you give to Ukraine is really worth three or four to them. You know, because things are cheaper and manufactured in, in a different way around the world. Point being, I think that there's a greater war on the idea of foreign aid in general. There's this talking point that you'll hear people repeat, maybe uh, mindlessly, things like, why do we need to help those people when we got so many problems here? Well, I don't think that that is really how the world needs to work or the, the proper perspective. I don't think it's an either or. I think that there's a lot of things in trade deals and things that maybe go on be, without your knowledge that make the world tick the way it does. Um, so how do you guys spend the money? Is it more like you spend it in the United States or in Ukraine? Uh, if possible, if we have unrestricted donations, we spend it in Ukraine because that has all kinds of benefits. You know, propping up the local economy. You're not waiting for the goods because it's there on site. Uh, if you source it locally, usually, like I said, it's cheaper. Um, you know, you're giving a local Ukrainian a job. Um, and then there's also customs fees and stuff that I'm avoiding by, by getting it inside the country. But then in this conflict, there's so many people that need help. Ukraine and Europe was sold out of a lot of the important items, heaters, generators, tourniquets, first aid kits for about six months because everybody and their brother was buying them. So if we can, we source it locally. If we can't get it, we bring it over. From like my perspective, like a lot of people I know my age aren't as um, up to date in like just the news in general. Like we get a lot of our information from medias like Instagram, whatever, yeah, yeah. like TikTok. And you just, I feel like there's a lot of things that are just being pushed above instead of making us aware of things that are actually happening. And I'm wondering, like, I know you touched on how um, a lot of people in power don't want you to be over there and using what you have to help. Do you think that has any impact from like political leaders on what they are feeding us in the media and what they are not showing us, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I don't necessarily think that there's any large scale effort to discourage people from helping. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's kind of you think about it kind of like the company line is you can't go. But when I walk into the U.S. Senator and Representative's office in D.C., they thank me for doing what I'm doing. You know, so it's like we have to do this officially public facing. But but every freedom loving citizen appreciates somebody trying to help somebody in Ukraine. So it's like, um, I don't necessarily think there's any campaign to, 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 uh, uh thwart do gooders. Even neglecting to like expose the issue greater. Isn't that kind of the same thing? Like oh, ignoring it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, guilt by omission kind of concept. Yeah. Let me say this. I certainly think that we could use a better PR director for the cause of Ukraine in the United States government, right? It, it, it seems like if ever there were an issue that should be 100% approval and, and unwavering support, it should be this. And I think that our leaders would do well to lead citizens to do more. I don't understand why we haven't seen that. Well, if citizens, especially like younger ones who if they're not getting this information and don't even know how large scale of a problem this is, they're not going to know how they can help. So. Right. Right. And, and I wonder if also, you know, I think somebody my age, 41 years old takes for granted that, that I was still having conversations with people who were alive during world war two in my lifetime. And now we are a generation removed from that. You know, it's, it's no teenager's fault in America that they don't know about the great depression because they don't know anybody that lived through that. You know, whose fault is that? It's it's our fault for not properly pushing those things, you know, to to make sure that everybody is informed about why it is important. If you don't know about World War II and what happened, it is likely that you would look at Ukraine and say, well, what's what's the big deal? You know, or or you could look at it like like that. So um, maybe what, two more minutes here. What do we got? Yeah, maybe one more question and then I'll just wrap it up with a little final final word. Go ahead. Um, I'm a little apart from the previous questions, but um, I think it's fair to say that in war, oftentimes when 
big push or reason that you know the Ukrainians are fighting for the land is because their spirit is high. They care about you know keeping their country. So I guess my question is. Have you seen anything in Ukraine that gives you hope or comfort that the Ukrainian people's spirit is strong and that they're not going to dwindle and that they'll achieve their goal? Yeah, I, I certainly do see a lot of that hope. Uh, and just one of the photos, just to just kind of highlight that. Um, you know, these guys, every single one of these guys on a weekend, they're doing combat medic training, um, unpaid Every one of those worked a civilian job before this thing started, right? And they're there at the local gymnasium taking medical training from our U.S. Navy corpsman who came over to volunteer and pass on what he knows, right? And there are rooms like this all over the country. The other rooms that look like this are filled with supplies that, the, that are needed for guys like this. The other rooms that you'll see across Ukraine are... Uh, you know, places where people have donated sleeping bags and cots for the refugees to sleep at their local church and community center. It's all hands on deck. It is, I'll tell you, I wish I could duplicate the spirit of the Ukrainian here in America, right? I mean, the United States of America going through this weird time, and a lot of people seem to be out of each throats over any number of things these last couple of years, and I don't know if we're really getting along very well, right? I wish that we could, as a society, Take the example of the Ukrainians, how they're unified right now, how they're all hands on deck. They only talk about victory. They never talk about defeat. They know that they will that they will come out on top with this thing. It's just a spirit that's inspiring um, in any society. I would hope that we would duplicate it here if if we were situation was reversed. Um, but I'm I'm very encouraged to know that my Ukrainian buddies. They're not going to let Russia do what Russia wants to do. Um, and so I, I, I think that's any ally. Any, anybody you want to make into an ally, um, you would want them to have the same spirit the Ukrainians do. Last one. I think the difference is we're so used to freedom. That's all we know. That's all we've had. Yeah. We've had 31 years, and anybody in their 40s can remember the bad time. Yeah. They don't want that to be taken away again. And I, I think, you know, as you study even further, you know, the revolution in 2014 that started at Maidan in Kiev, and they were, they've been fighting recently. This generation of Ukrainians has been fighting for their independence and freedom and for, for this set of principles. And so um, it is, it's not just, like when, I, like when I come back to America, I'll be honest, when I do these events, it, 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 the audience trends older, maybe because of the proximity to World War II. When I'm over there, the audience trends younger for some reason, right? It's not like the old people aren't involved. It's maybe the opposite. It's like the old people, they've seen this before. They've seen these lands run over from, for, you know, for, for centuries. They know how their grandfather did it, whatever. And so they're like, ah, it's more of the same. The young people are like, ooh, this is our chance to be free. And they're really serious about it. So final thing I'll say is this, um, you know, so war, war certainly brings about ethical questions left and right all over the place. You know, I, 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 the ethical questions that I had to ask myself being involved in this conflict, being a, you know, pseudo military member trying to support a foreign military on foreign soil with no authority to do so. You know, there was a lot of ethical questions that we had to ask ourselves. And certainly, you know, chief among them is, I don't think we talk enough about now that we talk about nukes these days, I don't think we talk enough about disarmament, right? Where's, where's our ethical role and the voice in that? You know, I, I think about all of the things that we had to, to, we used to be able to look towards the Pentagon and the founding documents and the rules and regulations in the military to, to look for cues as to what was ethical and how we should act. In this situation, we just had to look at our own hearts and minds because there was nobody to keep us accountable, hold us accountable, or report us. This is the Wild West out there. And, and certainly, wartime makes you ask some questions about, should I really go back to Ukraine in January because they're, they're conserving resources and power? Does a Westerner need to use those? You know, there's a lot of different ethical questions we can, we can ask ourselves. We hope that we have done our very best to do so uh, and follow the line properly. The most honorable, ethical 
thing I think that we could do for these people is, is give of our extra. Give of, uh, of what we can this Christmas. If we're going to spend $800 billion on these gifts that maybe a lot of people don't need, maybe we could make one of those gifts a gift for the Ukrainians, as some people here have done today. So I want to thank you for the time. I'll stay as long as you want, grab coffee, talk about these things. I could talk about this stuff all day. I want to say thank you for allowing me the opportunity, and uh, hopefully we can do some more good in the community for the Ukrainians. If you have a church, Kiwanis, you know, local community club that you would want me to come share with, it could be a small thing, a, a dinner. It, we could all go out to the, you know, a restaurant, and I would just love to share with as many people as possible uh, what's going on, and maybe we can activate some people to help. So thank you very much. I'm going to put my my contact information up here. Um, if you would like to get in touch, and then here is is uh, I, I I don't have my website for my nonprofit set up quite yet, but uh, you can get in touch uh, that way, and we can certainly help these people. So thank you so much.